The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, IRS Limited, ABN 47060313359, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Advice 2030, where we explore the future of financial advice. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and in this series, we're diving into the seven megatrends identified in a joint report by Deloitte and Iris. But before we look to the future, we're starting with how advisors are already using technology to boost efficiency and create great client experiences right now. Throughout the series, we'll also hear from Iris leadership about how they're turning insights from the report into action and what's coming up next on the product roadmap. So let's get started. Could your business take on 30 more clients? Through X-Plan, IRS is on a mission to help advice businesses boost efficiency and free up capacity. The goal? To help our industry get ready for the $2.1 billion advice opportunity revealed in the Big Shift research and to help bring more advice to more Australians. X-Plan, unmatched in advice technology. Welcome back to another episode where we explore the cutting-edge technology that's transforming the financial advice industry. Today, we've got a real treat for you, an insider's look at how one of the biggest names in the industry is revolutionising the way advisors do business. Joining me is none other than Kerry Ong from Iris, where he wears the hat of general manager customer. Kerry, it's fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Firstly, thank you for having me. I have been a long-time listener, a uh, first-time caller, and I'm really excited to be here. Oh, I love the first-time caller thing. That's <laughs> fantastic. So to kick things off, look, I'd love you to break down the title for us. What does it actually mean as somebody who's not in corporate land? What does it actually mean being the general manager of customer at Iris? What's that mean on a day-to-day basis? Mm-hmm. I, I see it as two things within Iris. So first off, it's me looking after the teams that look after our customers. Right. So everything from support through to our services team, uh, through to our customer success managers. Um, The other part is we represent the customer back into Iris as well because we obviously talk a lot to our customers. We we get a lot of feedback from them, what we're doing well, what the challenges are, and we make sure that we're, I guess, synthesizing that and bringing it back into Iris as well. Yeah. And look, that's that's probably a tough job, right? I mean, it's that two-way thing. Um, It can be very hard to manage both of those and keep them both humming. Oh, definitely. Look, I I think... We have made a commitment to listen to our customers. I think it's it's a, a real big change at Iris where we've, um, I guess we've not always been the best at listening and yeah. we want to make sure that we are hearing what people are thinking and feeling about us and we want to make sure that the product's fit for purpose. Yeah. We want to make sure that it's doing what it says it's going to do out of the box. And I'm sure like, there's a lot of advisors listening that can get caught in that caught up in that too. Like we're so focused on what we're doing and let's get it right internally. Sometimes you forget to open up and get, just ask the customer, gee, Would that help? Or, you know, so that interaction is so important, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And we're getting good at that. Yeah. And it's uh, really good at open questions. How how are we going? Yeah. Tell us a little bit more around how you use X-Plan. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we dive in, I'd love to just get a bit of a sense of your journey. What brought you here to Iris? You've actually had quite an interesting background in the industry. Yeah. So, I started off as an advisor. So, I was an authorized rep for over a decade, predominantly in the private wealth space um, in Australia and both in the UK. So, I was... Uh, I guess, a, a passionate advisor at that point. Um, and I've always, it, it really built my passion around advice. Yeah. Uh, after that, I went to Ida Bleff for Insignia Financial, um, working in business coaching, uh, client engagement coaching, uh, advice process improvement, and really technology was a key part to that, to stitch it all together. And I've been at Iris for 18 months. So really leaning on, I guess, being on the tools. Yeah. And then being, uh, I guess, a big licensee, enabling the tools. And now I'm working on the other side on the technology space. And it's great to hear that because I think sometimes when when we as practices or advisors as individuals are dealing with large businesses, it can feel like they don't fully understand us, understandably, you know, but to have somebody who's been there and done that can make such a difference to sort of represent us in Iris. Yeah, most definitely. I think yeah. the biggest learning for me is I've seen X-Plan from all angles. Right. Right. 
And I tried to bring that into my day to day. And I think I've got a lot of empathy in regards to how or what it takes to run a, a business and to make sure we're looking after clients. Yeah. And I make sure that Iris is um, considerate of that as well. Yeah. And like you said, our themes for today's episode is actually about listening. And it is that core facet of your commitment going forward with Iris to really understand and address the real challenges faced by financial advisors, you know, and the things on the day to day that they're trying to to deal with and implement with Iris. Now, from my conversation with Tim from Pivot Wealth in the last episode, who um, covered a number of key challenges that they've worked through, like we all do. And I'd love to sort of explore some of the themes that came out of that um, from, you know, your and Iris's perspective. Now, let's start with data, right? Dreaded data, far out. Um, you know, he had, they've got challenges about quality, consistency, people putting it in over there and it being different over, you know, on this side and the staff not being consistent themselves. Is that something you see across a lot of advice practices? Yeah, most definitely. And I think data is an issue until it's not an issue, yeah. right? Um, and there's no doubt that there's, a, I guess, data is a really key ingredient to get right um, to unlock efficiency, to unlock the use of technology, uh, especially in the advice space because yeah. we are a very data-heavy business, right? We need to know everything about our clients and we need to make sure that it's stored in the right way, it can be surfaced again in the right way. Yeah. Uh, so what we see with a lot of our practices, a root cause of a lot of issues is data management and data integrity. Right, okay. And do you see some of that being practices, like the way that the staff even behave? So some of the change can be having some rigor about the way they're even putting data in. Is yeah. that part of the challenge? And I think it's all about that. Yeah. It's all about setting roles and responsibilities, a process around your data management, really understanding where your data comes from and where it goes as well. I think the, the whole yeah. the whole flow of data within a system is really important. That is too, like when you think that's through, because you know we could be in one role putting data in because of the thing we're doing and we've been told to, not understanding the impacts it can have down the chain. Mm-hmm. And you're right, I think as a key KPI for every practice, you know, when we have it for ours, we're data quality, like just taking a little bit of extra time, mm-hmm. making sure that's correct. If you get an updated piece of information, make sure you update. But it is it is something that you've got to sort of keep front of mind, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think that whole downstream impact yeah. is really important to, to take into consideration because if you can catch things upstream, you are going to save someone downstream a whole heap of pain. Oh, right. And, and repetition. Yep. Like just having to do it again. Like it's so frustrating. And and it's interesting because I've seen in practices where they stop trusting the data mm. for that reason, right? And so they're just going to enter it all again anyway because they don't trust what's in there. Yeah, Peter, that that worries me. Yeah. Right? The repetition and repetition of data management. Um, for me, that's a, that's a, it's a red flag and it's a red flag that you should look into. So if there's, uh, I guess, for anyone on the line listening now, if there's any time that you're re-entering the same bit of data in two different areas, I think it's a consideration to ask yourself why. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious then, you know, how can they utilize the Iris Suite better to sort of address some of that? Yep. Well, I would say Iris isn't the panacea around data. Right. Right. When we are not a system that's going to fix data, but we're a system that uses data in a really great way. Right. And by a great way, I mean you enter it once and it resurfaces in different areas within the system. Yeah. Right. I think that's a really important part. So you, an example of that is you enter a super fund into client focus. It resurfaces in Wealth Solver. Right. For your product comparisons. It resurfaces in X Tools Plus for your modeling. So you're entering it once, get it accurate, and then it flows through to the rest of the system. So I think... Although it's not the panacea, it is an enabler to allowing data management. I think the data management process that we spoke about is something that really needs to be worked on across businesses that have a data issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And it's really around asking yourself a few key key questions. And it's not yourself. Ask yourself and your team a few few key key, key questions. It's when you're collecting a fact find, where does that data go? (laughs) When your client's calling up with a little bit of extra information, what are you doing with it? After a review meeting, what are you doing with the information that you collect from there? I think asking those questions will help you build, I guess, a data management um, process within your business. And when you think about it from the client's experience too, there is nothing more frustrating as a consumer of anything, no matter what the product or service is, when you've got to repeat yourself. Mm. Like like if you want to see my head explode, I get asked the same thing from different people in a team. Our clients are the same. So if somebody, if one of our clients has told one member of the team a piece of information, 
making sure that gets transmitted through into the system so that the team have confidence in that is really important. Oh, so important. I think that's where the process comes into play. Yeah. Process with the combination of roles and responsibility around data, it, it creates, I, I guess, less friction in regards to the data management process. And it really allows you to, I guess, have integrity around the, your data. And it does need, I, I guess, from a mindset thing, though, that it, there is a bit of a shift. And I saw it in our team where I needed to say to them, have a think about how you can benefit the next person, like getting them to think about that chain, getting them to think about what it means for the rest of the team. We're very good at focusing on efficiency for ourselves or to be faster if, but not often naturally as human beings do we think, yeah, but that could mess it up for Bob down there. You know, like, yeah. So I think there is a bit of a mindset shift, particularly with data, to consider what it'll mean for the rest of the team. Yeah. I I love a process mapping exercise. Yeah. And I love a team process mapping exercise. And we used to do it back in, uh, when I was at IWF called Brown Paper Process Mapping. Yep. Where you'd get the team in a room and you actually take the flow from start to finish with everyone in the room and everyone present. So they understand that, you know, person A entering a super fund here is actually really going to benefit person B who's doing the SOA and be- benefit the advisor when he's presenting an SOA to- yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And any anytime you do that, there is invariably one role that has no clue that by changing a little thing they do is going to save 30 minutes over there for that team member. I see that a lot between advice teams and implementation teams, Um, you know, and just a little change in the advisor's behavior and suddenly the implementation team have everything they need and then they can run off and do what they need to do, you know. So I agree, mapping it out completely makes such a difference. Yeah, it also allows you to break it down into smaller chunks. Yeah, I think people see- Money manual chunks, that's right. People see data management as this big beast. Yeah. Um, But it is actually just a series of small steps. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Then it sounds like, though, that this is going to be something we're all going to be just dealing with down the track, right? This is not necessarily uh, going to get easier as much as we're just going to need to get better at it or more focused. Is that a fair summary, do you think? Yeah, I think it's always going to be around. Yeah. Like like I said, I think data is an issue until it's not an issue, right? And I think to make it not an issue, you just need to really focus in on it. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, the only other part we haven't touched on, which of course is data feeds, right? Which is another thing people focus on. Mm -hmm. I think though, you know, I'd put that in the category of of you can't control some things and data feeds are sometimes one of them. Um, Whereas the way we collect data that we collect, the fact find information, Mm -hmm. focus on that at the very least and it will still improve, you know, how things operate in the business. Is that fair take? Yeah. Look, I think think at a minimum, focus on what you can control. Yeah. I think- Secondary to that, data feeds, it is one of the, the biggest topics within my support team. Right, okay. Um, but with that is I think you can still build data management processes around data feeds. Right. right? There's effort required to be able to check those on a day-to-day basis. Um, who's doing it in your business and, and why is, okay. is also important. Yes, we can't control if a provider sending through the wrong information yeah. or RSS sending through the wrong information. Yeah. But picking it up early. Definitely helps. Right. Um, and making sure you manage that also helps. So some rituals, some rigor. Yeah. Yeah. Or generally, I say it's, it's a job that someone should check every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Let's talk about the next uh, awesome, ginormous topic. We could probably have a whole episode just on this, which is, you know, the tech stack integration. Yeah. So getting all the pieces working together. Tim, in the last episode, mentioned sort of that complexity, right? Because we're all using more tools. It's not like we're, we're using less. There's all these new widgets and these great things that we can engage with. How do you guys approach that integration of different systems? Because clearly ours can't be everything to everybody, and I'm not sure you'd want to necessarily. So how do you guys picture that from a tech ecosystem perspective and that integration piece? Mm-hmm. We look at it from two angles. First off, the way x actually built is somewhat like a integrated tech stack. Okay. So we've got a CRM um, that holds the core information. Then we've got associated tools that sort of plug into it. Talk to it. Okay. Talk to it. So okay. think of Wealth Solver, Risk Research, Excel Plus. It's all sort of built in this, um, I guess, tech stack style environment. Yep. However, x is one system. So yeah. it's looked at as one system. Uh, but we are definitely open to partners. We've seen the emergence of a whole heap of really, really, really great providers out there with some really great features that complement what Iris are doing. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are available on Iris Open, so you yeah. can actually integrate with them now. We're actually going through a strate- strategic review of Iris Open at the moment, though, and our integration partners. Yep. Because what we want to make sure is who we're integrating with, the integration works to start with, because right. we don't want that yeah. double handing of information. Yeah. Um, and we want to make sure that what they're adding to our system or to the tech stack is actually not offset by some inefficiencies on one side. Oh, I swear. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're going through a fairly a fairly big strategic review and that 
uh, is on our existing Iris Open integrators, but yeah. also open to new ones at the moment because the world is shifting and changing. Oof, that sure is. And I, I'm I'm curious about, I mean, you're a global company, so you actually have more of a global perspective than anybody listening probably does then you must be seeing globally a lot of new tools coming up all the time. Like it's just constant. You can't keep up with a new fintech, right? No, you can't. But what you can do is you can keep your eye on everything because it helps shape the way that we think about our product. It also helps um, us shape the way that we think about integrations or let's call it build versus buy. Yes. It's who do we integrate with or what can we do really well internally. And yeah, um, I think we know like we've, we've, we know where our strengths are at Iris. Right. We also know where integration would really help us. Yeah. And I think it ha- the, the tech world, I would say, has also shifted where uh, now p- somebody can deliver a really niche, narrow thing that just does it really well. Uh-huh. Whereas I think in the old days, they had to be part of a bigger, you know, a bigger tool. Um, whereas these days, they can be that little thing. So if it can integrate for you guys and it works well, well, why not? You know, they've got that genius. They've applied it. They've solved the problem. Yay. Um, so I'm imagining that's, you know, as you guys go forward, that's what you'll be assessing, right? The difference between, hey, that was great. You build that perfect versus actually it makes sense for us to do this in-house. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we get a knock on the door every day of the week. I bet. <laughs> so I think anyone who releases anything around financial advice from a technology perspective in Australia, they knock on the door of Iris and say, can we integrate, right? Um, and I think it's a big barrier for people using their systems if they can't integrate with Iris. Yeah. We want to make sure we're removing the barriers for those who we believe are really great integrations and yeah. and complementary features to to what we currently provide. Now, I haven't warned you about this question, but I'm curious now, given what we were just chatting about. Do you think there's ever a point, though, that we get a bit over-obsessed about integration where we're like, you know what, you're overcooking that. You may not need to integrate at all. It happens all the time. Okay. Right. And that's why I, I started to say, started out by saying Iris actually is, or Xplan is, an integrated platform, right? Yeah. And-, and it's when I see, let's say someone trying to replace Xtools Plus with another modeling pool to run. I kind of look at it and go, well, have you looked in your own backyard first or yep. Iris backyard to see what we've got? And have you squeezed the most out of it? To be honest, if you've actually squeezed the most out of it and there's a feature that we don't have, great. Yeah. Integrate. Yeah. Uh, but we do see that people look to integrate first and almost chase that bright, shiny um, yeah. thing. And it's not a bad thing. I, I love that, I guess, the competitive nature of um, – advice technology in Australia right now. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I think it's a, a big opportunity for everyone, but are they making the right decisions or are they making the decisions based on a, a really great sales pitch? Right. And I think also there, there's tools that, I mean, I, and I've heard advisors say, oh, we really want it to integrate. I'll go, well, how often is it going to do something? Like how often is that going to occur? Oh, only a few times, say a month. Well, does that need integration or does that need a cheap resource just to go from there to there? Like it's sometimes we get a bit caught up in the complexity of tech. Definitely, yeah. yeah de- I've the, like when the word API becomes a yes. normal a, a normal word that everyone's throwing around. Because yeah. to be honest, I don't like I'm I'm not a tech guy in advice. I'm an advice guy in tech, right? right? Um, and I think we've got a lot of um, advice people who are tilted towards technology. Yeah. But APIs become this sort of normal, um, I guess, part of the vocabulary mm-hmm. now, and it actually it worries me because everyone's like, "Yep, I want to plug everything in every- everywhere." Yeah. Uh, we always try to break it down to okay, why? What's it bringing? Um, can it properly integrate, right, yeah. and remove the friction that you're, you're you're wanting to have in the system? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, that sort of brings us naturally to the next focus, which is you know efficiency. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it seems obvious. It's like saying we need oxygen to breathe, right? I mean, efficiency is a core part of every advice practice, and the harder our job gets, the more we need it. It's clearly, you know, Tim mentioned it for Pivot Wealth. It's clearly a focus. Is this a common thing that you hear from practices? Is this just, we just need more efficiency? My world for the past, I'll call it 10 years, has been efficiency. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think, especially uh, working within a big licensee, everyone's seeking efficiency. Now working in a tech company, everyone's seeking efficiency. Yeah. Um, and it's a result of our changing landscape of advice that we're working in. Yeah. Right. Regulatory pressures, legislative pressures, it's all added steps to the process. Yeah. Um, but we still want to deliver as much advice to as many, as many Australians as we can. So what we have to do is try to do it in the most efficient way. Right, exactly. And it's it's such an interesting thing too, though, efficiency, because we've all seen all sorts of things like getting your client to fill in a fact file, all these tools. And, and it's such an interesting balance, isn't it? Because you can make yourself more efficient, but you could be putting more on your clients. Mm-hmm. So I think that's also an interesting dynamic that we've all got to balance, isn't it? It's making sure we're not outsourcing to the client. 
Yeah, I think there's a whole piece around the client engagement process right. and the client experience that needs to overlay all the decisions within your business. Yeah. Um, pushing, I guess, the burden on a, a, a client isn't always the greatest experience, right? No. Um, but it might be saving you time. So yeah. how do you balance that? How do you balance that off? And yeah. how do you make it a good experience for both parties? Yeah. And it may come down to packages and pricing. Mm-hmm. Like you may actually price it that way. And if somebody's willing to do more, as a client, then they may get a lower packet. I mean, that's great, you yep. know, but understanding that that's what you're doing and that they're making that choice. They're happy to do it because mm. I know I can only speak for myself, but I hate getting things outsourced to me. <laughs> they're saying, oh, if you can just fill in this 47-page document. Nope, not doing it. Yep. <laughs> you know? mm. So, yeah, it's it's part of the process, I guess. So, are there any specific features or updates, you know, recent updates for X-Plan really designed on that streamlining operations? Is there things that you guys have rolled out that you felt have really had an impact? Well, I think our tools are always evolving, right? right? And that's where a lot of the efficiency lies. I, I couldn't think of another tool that is more efficient at cash flow modeling than Xtools Plus yep. or Visualize, yep. right? And Visualize is one that I'd love to go and talk a bit more about. Mm. Um, client engagement is a big piece that every advisor wants to get right and do it in an efficient way. And yeah. there, to be honest, you go back four or five years, there wasn't an efficient way. No. Um, and that's why we listened and, and we built Visualize and we think we believe it's a really efficient way to, to sit and demonstrate the value of advice in front of a client. Yeah. But then you go down to product comparisons, you know, that you go back, you know, 10 years and you're looking at two PDSs and comparing oh. the details. And I don't know if you remember, but I, I, I remember just scouring through PDS to through oh, PDSs. It's horrible. It's at a click of a button now. So you talk about efficiency. If anyone's not doing that, then I, I think they definitely need to look at that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think it all stitches together with our tasks and threads as well. Okay. And that's not just around process. I think process leads to efficiency. That's right. But within tasks, there's actually some automation that you can have from a task outcome perspective. And it's one that you can dig a bit further into where you can automatically update fields or you can automatically navigate to particular areas um, to let the system do the work for you. Yeah, and I think that's probably a shift, isn't it, for an X-Plan user because historically you guys have always had things like threads or, or hey, here's the next step, mm-hmm. but that's not automation. Automation is when it does the next step. Yeah. Yeah, like and automatically, that makes such a huge difference. That's right. Automatically updating a field, automatically prompting a template to pop up. Right. Um, and templating is also a big thing, right? Yeah. If there's anything that you're typing more than once, again, template it. Yeah. And if you can template it and then build it into a task outcome that's controlled by a process and thread, then you've almost started to get, you know, I'll call it the robots working for you. Yeah. And it's it's probably a bit of a shift that you guys have to have to teach practices where often we're looking for a big win, like we take a big thing and we want to make that more efficient. When in reality, often it's those repetitive little things, isn't it? And having the template and then having the trigger and having the automation, but we do a hundred of those a day. And that's where you get some real value and time back. That is where you get a lot of the time back. And yeah. what we find is a lot of people are long-term X-Plan users. So they believe they've squeezed as much out of the tools as possible. Right. Um, but it's about how do you actually take a step back and review the use of what they're using? Um, how do we build, you know, those one percenters in there to accumulate to 10, 20, 30 percent? And it, it, you're probably you're really right, actually. When I think about it, when I look at um, you know, like the plans for tech companies and particularly in our industry, often it feels a bit slow, like from a smartest perspective. Mm. But we're probably the same with our own processes and upgrading, right? Where we could take a step back and go, should we be leaping a couple of steps? Is there things we should be doing a bit differently? Um, just like we would love tech to do that, you know? And so we need to ourselves go, wait a minute, I know we think we've got this nailed and we've been doing it this way for a little while. The minute you say we've been doing it this way for a little while, you probably need to revisit Right, and take advantage of some more of the automation. Yeah, definitely. And I think even the the look through of what's happening across your whole business is yeah. one that's really important. I think um, I've seen people get in the traps of, you know, they're a practice principal, they're working with clients directly, they're somewhat running the business, but they don't know what's happening under the bonnet from, I guess, the admin and the power planning teams. Right. It's how do we actually, you know, st- I guess, step out of the business and look at what's happening across, across the entire business to understand where the efficiencies could come. Right. And, and capacity can be a really important thing. And there are, there's going to be a number of practices listening that are actually at the point where they're struggling with having enough capacity, right? And they're overstretched. Yeah. Um, and being able to see through and being able to turn that tap on or off can make a huge difference to how you can handle wait lists or anything you might have for new clients, right? Yeah. It's even just being brave enough to be able to turn that tap on and off. Yeah. Right. I think a lot of people just leave it on and let it run. And just, yeah, chaos. Yeah. 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 And, and they work within chaos. Yeah. Um, and and no one's satisfied working in a world of chaos. No, no, absolutely. So then 
scalability, now, which is interesting, and I'd love to sort of combine this with visualize here. So, you know, trying to impact more people in a more engaging way is undoubtedly going to get us to improve the lives of more Australians. How do you feel your tools can help deliver that scale? You know, because it is a little different to efficiency. So efficiency is sort of the whatever we're doing now, we do a bit better. Mm -hmm. Scale is that, wow, we can reach far more people. So what have you guys got that um, can really help with that? Yeah. Visualize is definitely part of it. Okay. Right. And visualize is a tool that allows you to really efficiently demonstrate the value of advice very quickly with clients. Okay. Right. So that's, um, but that's somewhat on a one-to-one basis. We're also doing a bit of work in regards to our digital advice journey, yep. right? And we're actually about to come to market with, um, I guess, a digital advice tool that can actually accelerate advice in the pro- provision of advice. At the moment, we're working with super funds, but yep. we see it, I guess, broadening beyond the super fund environment. Um, but I think we need to think about how that model will change what advice is right. for the everyday advisor. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you think about scale, often what that means is the more repetitive, um, narrow things can get handled in a more automatic fashion, Mm -hmm. the complexity or the behavioral things, right? The human things then get handled by an individual. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we don't think it's one or the other. No. Right. I think it it has to be the the combo. Um, and and that's where we see it working the best is that there is a combo and there is a handoff and, um, especially because you can demonstrate advice implementing advice a lot of clients and what we've seen is a lot of clients um still need to talk to someone or still yeah. want to be able to be able to you know pick up the phone and, and get a bit of comfort that they're doing the right thing yeah. but they might want to soak up a lot of information and education on a scalable bulk way yeah. but it's how do we actually flow really seamlessly between the two that sort of brings me actually to something that is often a barrier for scale or even efficiency is that implementation piece now i know that that sort of at the point at which Iris has sort of done their hard work and then it goes to platforms or to insurers. Is that something you guys are focused on is, is how do we then stop that being the point at which everything comes to a screeching halt and it becomes a bit manual or a bit repetitive again? Yeah. We've done some exploratory work Yeah, um, where we've uh, had engagement with platform providers right. on how we can actually take some of the friction out of, uh, I guess, implementation. Yeah. Right? Um, and there are some bits of work that we've done with some platforms where there is an integration that yep. allows for the flow of information directly to application. Beautiful. Right? Um, it hasn't been scaled yet, right? Yeah, okay. At the moment, it's still on a one-to-one basis with the platforms. Yeah. And the platforms need to have um, as much motivation to do it as, as we do. Right. Um, I would love to see that expand. Yeah. Right? It's, I wouldn't say it's directly on our roadmap at the moment, but we do. what is on our roadmap is we understand the friction point of, in, of implementation um, and we'd love to be able to partner with, you know. Right. See that momentum to- where there's more. And it is, as somebody who we used to have a license for mortgage broking and in mm-hmm. their space, they have a tool where every lender is basically you feed in the application at the front as the mortgage broker and then it pushes it out to them. And to me, that clearly means it's possible. Mm-hmm. You know, it just requires everybody to be willing to step up. And so I guess for listeners, that means we've got to make more noise to our platforms and say, come on. This is necessary for scale, if nothing else. Yeah, definitely. Tell them to come knock on our door. Yeah. And we're, like we're willing to work on this stuff. Um, we want to make sure we're we're removing that friction and we understand, sure, it's not just the friction, it's the errors, it's everything that right. can occur as well. Absolutely. And it's because that's the thing that uh, we see in our practice is we can get the advice process as tickety-boo as you like, mm-hmm. but the minute it hits implementation, it slows right down through no fault of our own, you know? And so if we are going to see more people, if scale is going to become real- Yep. How do we- How do we make that happen? That's exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. Now, an interesting one that came out when I chatted to Tim was modeling. So they're actually doing, and I apologize to Tim in advance if I get this number wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's over 75 scenarios every few weeks. So they're doing constant scenarios. I think a lot of them are more- cash flow orientated than potentially uh, what I would call financial engineering, Mm -hmm. you know, when we're looking at the future that way. Are you seeing this building? Is this something that is getting bigger for advice? Yeah, we've seen the absolute uptick of the use of XTools Plus within the whole entire um, network. And a credit credit to Tim and the Pivot team, 75 uh, financial models a month is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, but what it also shows me is that they're really committed to demonstrating that value of advice for, right. for their clients, right? And I'm, I'm a big believer in um, using modeling to demonstrate the value of advice, to help demonstrate their ability to, to achieve goals and to really improve the life of all Australians. Right. Um, so I, I love this trend that we're seeing a lot more modeling. With that, we are building a lot more into our models as well. So 
if you've kept like we've got a lot of people who are big fans of Xtools Plus and we've um, definitely listened to what they want and need and you know we've added downsizer contributions we've added investment bond um, modeling because we've always found that these are feedback gaps and right. um, I'd love to say that we're exploring now the annuities piece and right the actually, whole new retirement income streams and all that sort of stuff that's exactly yeah. right because we're seeing this big retirement gap um, growing and growing and growing and we're seeing that I guess the use of that product becoming more prevalent across Australia yeah uh, but we want to be able to support that within the system because it's inefficient at the moment yeah the way that they have to produce that yeah and it's a it is such an interesting thing i remember i'm I'm dating myself here but well over 15 years ago when really tools like x tools plus were the you might have one person in an office that would do that and it was only for the really the re-contributions like strategy the old like complexity Mm. everybody else never really went that far whereas now it's a core part like we're all doing this. We're all trying to paint that picture of the future for clients. Yeah, definitely. You know, and giving it some substance. And all of them. I would say Xtools Plus is the most comprehensive modern tool I've seen. Right. It definitely it definitely is. It has become a bit easier to use as well. Right. Right. And the way so you used to have to know some tricks, right? There was sort of a hidden <laughs> You used to have to know a lot of work around like yeah, oh, right. Yeah, um, yeah. But now I think if you got the data right, okay. right? So that's first off, get the data right. You can push that data directly in, and it somewhat creates a base scenario for you. Yeah, and then you can just play around the outside of it. And that's using Xtools Plus as a, I'll call it a fully fledged um, modeling tool. But now we've built Visualize, yeah. which sort of sits on top of Xtools Plus, um, and it's more engaging. It's a little bit simpler to use. You can actually apply scenarios in a really simple way with a couple of clicks, rather than having to go through, um, I'll call it the dreaded tables of Xtools Plus, which right. you know, some people love, but but it, it does scare some people away. From yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. And the, the versions and keeping track of, and it was like, oh goodness, you know. Yeah. So, and I, I it really does, you know, modeling. Um, we shouldn't kid ourselves that people necessarily understand the details of the modeling when we're presenting it to clients, but it is a bit about making something tangible for them of the future, yeah, you know, definitely. and so it does It does do that. And often, I mean, we find once we push forward where they're at now and they get to see what's possible, often they surprise themselves. They just don't realize, well, yeah, you could do that. Mm. You could take that sabbatical for six months. You could do, you know, but you've got to show them in the numbers for them to believe it. I love that feeling of being able to demonstrate that they can do something they've always wanted to do but didn't know they could do it. Yeah. Right. And you kind of get that. Uh, this is the bit I miss about advice is you get that almost sigh of relief from a client to say, oh, I'm so glad that you did that for me because yeah. it just gives me so much peace of mind, right? Yeah. I think the other benefit of using tools like x Plus and Visualize is you can do that in front of a client and then the exact same things in the SOA that you're presenting to your client, right? right? There's that consistency in the message. It gives them that sort of peace of mind that you're not just, you know, demonstrating sort of bells and whistles and, and, yeah. and, and a scenario. It's actually, no, no, this is your situation. Um, this and is what, what we talked about and here's the, yeah. That's right. And so that, and that, that, plays to that customer experience we were talking about. You know, there's consistency um, and that's really powerful. I've got to say I love and I now wait for it. Once they, once you unlock that belief mm. in that first go, I wait for the email that'll come within about 24 hours with that, what, what about, about if we did this thing? I love it. You know, when they get and it just unlocks their, it's almost like hopes. They're like, hold on, wait a minute. If that's possible, what about if this is possible? It you know? absolutely opens up that goals-based advice conversation. Yeah, it does. Right, I think – that initial goals-based conversation is always a little bit tricky because they don't know that clients don't want to tell you too much because they don't want to sort of overcomplicate things. And it's a skill of an advisor to get as much of that out as possible. But yeah. once you've sort of unlocked the ability to achieve that base goal, yeah, the what ifs come out. Oh, what if? What if I got a new car every year instead of every second year? It's like, yeah. well, if you can do it, great. Yeah, I've always wanted to start my own business about this. Is that possible? Like, it's I love those conversations, yeah. and I love it between couples too to be able to see them. Look at each other. Like, Wait a minute! You never told me you wanted to do that. Like that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, you're really sort of seeing building a, a future for them. Definitely. So, look, I think you know, we've covered loads of what Tim chatted about and and the sort of rigor in the system. There's also a whole lot of work you guys are doing in terms of you know adapting and and growing with innovation. Um, then I'm sort of really taking a step back. You know, talking about the advice industry, the trauma, change, legislation, like pick them. Pick a flag. Mm-hmm. There's been many of them, um, as we've all had to evolve and then implement shifts. I'm I'm really curious, and this is partly my own curiosity. Taking advantage of having this mic, I'd love to know: Have you guys had to change either the underlying code or the build or the way X plan fits together to cope with what's happened over time? Like, has there been any big shifts? We're like, whoa, we're just going to have to rebuild this thing. Has there been any of that? Oh, there's been a lot of that, okay. Peter. Uh, so, me jumping into Iris, I, 
I didn't know what it took to run a tech company. Right. Um, but really understanding, I guess, how X-Plan was built in its foundation to where it is today, it's been a big journey. And yeah. that big journey is either adding things or rebuilding things along the way. Yeah. Um, and a, a credit to our technology team and the developers there is that they do it in stride and they, they okay. take it with effort. Um, I've seen a, a massive shift. And if you think back think back five years ago with X-Plan or even 10 years with X-Plan, upgrades were once a month. Right. Right. And they'll planned and you upgrade. We upgrade a few times a week now. Okay. Wow. Right. Um, so you think about what it went, it went from these sort of big fundamental shifts to the, a lot of incremental shifts along the way. And right. and with that is a whole change in the way that our team codes okay. and develops and um, iterates the- More nimble sort of approach. Nimble. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. And what it, uh, what I'll say to everyone listening is that that-, that um, I guess incremental change is something to keep because uh, there used to be bells and whistles around big changes. Yes. Right now, there's a lot, a lot of small ones, but you've got to keep on top of you know, our community and ensemble and advisory and everything to work out what those and our product roadmap to work out when those changes are coming and how they rolled out. Which sort of loops back to what we were saying earlier on that somebody could be what they would consider a, a power user of X Plan, but if they haven't consistently gone through and understood those changes, there's probably some great value there that they don't even realize that they could implement. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. we we think it's not only on the advisor, we shouldn't expect the advisors just to, uh, Iris needs to do more in regards to communicating right. that as well. So we're doing our, our best to get as much of that information out into the hands of everyone as possible. And look, sometimes um, the way to approach that can be, oh, you don't keep on top of it on a weekly basis, but once a month, you go back and look through the releases and go, hold on, out of all those features, is there anything that might apply? And it doesn't, you're right, it doesn't need to be the advisor. If you've got a member of the team in the support team who loves that sort of stuff, then just make it part of their KPIs. Check it out. Is there anything you think would be really valuable? You know, and as long as you sort of iterate that way, if we, if we in our practice can reflect the iteration you guys are going through, that's probably, you know, the way to get some value constantly, yeah. you know, for the process. Yeah. And I, I would say, our product roadmaps, release quarterly. We're committed to release them quarterly. That's probably one that I'd say for anyone looking at the bigger chunks of work that Iris are working on, definitely tune into those. Yeah, okay. And then for anything smaller, sitting in our release notes. Yeah, so, okay. so build if you can build that into, again, process and process. rhythms within your business, you'll go a long way with using our systems. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's just a bit like getting the, um, you know, taking the car for a service and getting the upgrade on the GPS or whatever. Like it's just got to be part of what you do, right? Yeah. It's, just, it's a core tool. It's a core part of the practice. You know, we've got to treat it that way. Mm-hmm. I'm curious then with the, you know, those two letters we're hearing a lot of now, AI, um, the emergence of it is that I'm imagining it's something that's being actively discussed within the walls of Iris. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't need to tell me what's going to happen, but I'm curious how do you assess that? Like, how do you guys work out what you should act on or not and when it's all moving so quickly? Mm, definitely. It is an ongoing conversation within the walls of Iris. And as early as, early as today, I've had a conversation with someone about an experiment that we're, we're doing within, within our innovation team. So, we've got a data innovation team okay. within Iris. Um, and what we task them with is to experiment around um, AI and large language uh, models to really work out what the possibilities within X-Plan are. Um, and we've had a lot of proof of concepts over the last 12 months, right? Okay. Um, I'll say we are bullish on a AI solution coming to, to life within X-Plan. Yep. We're very bearish on the security that we want to make sure that, that yeah. it has, right? Um, so anything we built won't just be a, hey, throw it into chat GBT and have it spit back to us because yeah. um, we understand the sensitivities of client information. Yeah. Uh, but what it will be is it'll be purpose-built. It'll be integrated within X-Plan and it is going to – ideally, save time and and, and increase efficiency for our advisors. Yeah. And look, there's so many applications, like you say, within a sort of a closed environment. Even then, there's so many applications. I mean, for me, guardrails around strategies. Like, so if the system knows, like you've entered the client's data, if the system can just know, Peter, you didn't consider this strategy, do you want to include that? Like, that's just so valuable, you know, and that is something that tools like AR can do, yep. you know, even without, like you say, going out into the big bad world and having the risk of the data, you know, going where you don't want it to. Yep. So there, there's got to be so many layers of that. Um, so I feel for you guys, like, where do you start, right? Which which one do you do first? Yeah. So, Peter, like that use case is probably something that we have maybe looked at within yeah. the Iris world, but we've looked at a whole heap of use cases. And what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're, we're somewhat – exploring a lot of those use cases and we're also watching what the industry is doing as well because that's that's evolving very fast as well. Yes. 
um, just so we make the right decision and the right call in regards to what we come out with first, right? Yeah. We um, we don't want to, I'll call it AI wash X plan. No. Uh, but we want to make sure that we, when we do introduce a tool or an add-on or whatever it might be, um, that it is somewhat native and it actually does add something back. Yeah. Because it, it certainly has the possibility of being rocket fuel. Like it does have that. Yep. But- Rocket fuel has dangers associated, so we all need to understand, you know, and it is there is a really important balance we've all got to find, you know, with these tools. Um, but yeah, the pace alone, I just can't believe how many are coming out. It's just crazy, yeah, one after the other. That's right, and it, it does complicate things because as we're experimenting and building, we've got a whole integration conversation having as well, <laughs> happening as well, and a lot of those new people knocking on our doors are AI um, providers or feature providers. And they're wanting to integrate with us. So we're looking at what should we build versus what should we partner with Yeah, um, and what is best for the end user. Yeah, yeah. And look, I'm, I think the probably the thing for the listener to to understand is the more they can just witness what's going on out there, probably the better they'll in, then be able to utilize the tools you guys come up with. You've, yeah. you've got to start thinking a little bit differently. This is the world is changing. And so the more we can just sort of understand it, you know, even if it's playing with chat GPT to write a, a birthday card, just understanding how these tools work will just mean when you guys come out with these things, we're all better and more capable of using them. I think, yeah, going I forward. agree. Yeah. I agree. It's all about playing, right? Now, a similar theme I mean, this changing legislation stuff is clearly not going to stop. I mean, if you'd asked me way back when, 15 years ago, when, you know, we had these big milestone things. And I think in the industry at that point, we thought, oh, they're going to have this big piece of legislation and then we'll be left alone. Huh. Turns out that wasn't the case and clearly isn't going to be. How do you guys approach these changes? So, you've, you know, there's loads of them, FDS, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You know it's coming. It hasn't been made clear quite what it's going to be. You know that the minute they turn it on, your users are going to need to be doing something different. How do you manage that internally? Mm. First off, we always have a subject matter expert okay. on anything that we hear is coming. Um, so, example, QAR, we've got someone on there. Feature set, we've had someone on there. Like, uh, So, that's the first step that we, we take is yeah. we make sure that we've got um, someone inside the business that owns that. Secondly, is we definitely partner. Right. So, either with our industry bodies or directly with the government um, to make sure that we're staying close to what's coming what's down. Happening. Yeah. What's happening down the path. Then we make sure that we are continuously monitoring that. Like it's, we, I'll say, build prototypes and concepts. We don't, not the full build, right? But we, we start to understand that if this happens, right. this is how it would shape. Yeah. And we make sure that we've got enough, I'll call it, um, capacity within our teams, within um, our technology and coding team and our product teams, et cetera, to be able to bring it to life if it does. To flex when if that's necessary, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so we, we make sure that we've got the right people on it. We make sure that we've got a little bit of um, partnering with the industry on it. Then we make sure that we're ready internally once we actually have to put the rubber to the road on it as well. And has the approach evolved over time? I know, you know, years back, potentially there might have been a view that there's only one way to do things, say, when, it, when, it, when there's a release or when, you know, the government announced something. Are you guys now sort of looking at it as a, well, different practices are going to approach this different ways. How do we just make sure the system can respond to that? Is it a bit different now for how you roll those things out? Yeah, it goes in both ways, though, Peter. Yeah. Okay. So we definitely go down the path of flexibility, yeah. right? So the, and, and accommodating the change through configuration within a system. Right. But there's certain areas where we believe that we could potentially lead the way as well. Yep. Right. But we, we make that judgment call based upon what we when we talk with the industry bodies and we talk with the with the government, whether or not we should be leading that or whether we should um, create that flexibility. Yeah, okay. And I guess as part of the sort of leaning into listening, then the more um that users sort of chat to you guys and and also on the ensemble space, you know, just say, Hey, this is coming up. What if we could do this? Then the more you get that input, right? And you can start to challenge the team and go, but what if we change that? You know, we want to hear all that. Yeah. Right. Uh, we um, do not want to be the ones making the call on everything. Right. Right. We want to make sure that we're listening to the industry and we're getting the ideas because there are some amazing ideas out in the industry. And if we're not asking for those ideas or listening to those ideas, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And it is some of this stuff is this administrative burden mm -hmm. and. In my experience, there is so many different ways to approach those things. And sometimes 
one group will just see it in such a clear way and they will cut through. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why, I'm, that's why I love hearing other ways people approach things because so, somebody will come out with a solution. You're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe we've been making it this hard. So I'd encourage any of the listeners to make sure you're integrating, sorry, talking to the IRS team. Like if you see something that you think would be wonderful, they need to feed that back. Right, they need to talk to your your people. Definitely, we like the ensemble space that we've launched. Is like I I love it. I read through every single comment, and there's yeah. things I pick up on there that I haven't even thought of. Right, and I, I believe I know the system f- fairly well. Yeah. I believe I know the industry fairly well. But when you start to pick up on, I uh, just ideas or yeah. the way people are using the system, and you, you think, oh wow, this, you know, we've the network is so important. I yeah, mean, it technology. really is, isn't it? And it's. I think the other thing is um, I love new entrants. I love people that are new to advice because they are just not indoctrinated like mm. the rest of us, right? And that's sometimes that's the cut through you need to is somebody goes, I can't believe you're making it this hard. Why don't you just do this, you know? Yeah. Is there any of the changes historically that um, – and I know that you've only been with Iris for, say, the 18 months, but that you know for Iris was just the most arduous, like there was something that you had to implement that was just truly horribilous from your perspective? Uh, well – I was I was at IWF when we had to implement FDS and renewal. Yeah, right. Um, and I think just building the whole process around FDS and renewal was was a big piece. Yeah. Um, I think Iris that was a big change for Iris in regards to what the or how they had to build what they had to build in the system to be able to track and monitor and um, timeliness and due dates and all of that. It is a bit of a shift, isn't it? It is a big yeah. shift. It's a, it's like we went from a world where you effectively didn't you could have clients and really not service them. Right. right. That's uh, like that's. You think about it now, it's a horrible world to live in. Yes. Um, but it went to a world where you had to and you had to tell them how much they were paying and it, then you had to tell them what you were delivering to them. Yeah. It's how to, how to first off, you do that as a, an advisor in a practice, but secondly, as an AFSL, how do you monitor that? Yeah. Um, and that, I, I know, because we worked really close with Iris at that time, that that was a big sort of industry movement. Yeah, and it's a... It, it was a shift for us because you go from, here's our process and here's, say, the threads and the tasks mm-hmm. to here's our process and our threads, but we've got this drop dead date we've all got to meet and then we've got to delay it here and then we've got to collect. Like it's, it became more of a logistics exercise, mm. right? It was, it's, it really did shift what we had to focus on. So it'll be interesting to see what gets unlocked when part of that, you know, doesn't become necessary, but we've still got the other part ticking along. It'll be so interesting to see how it, how practices still approach it. Yeah, that's right. And we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Yeah. Because right? we want to make sure that the system can accommodate to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And like we were saying with implementation before, I mean, consent is a perfect one where if something could just push through to providers, like, you know, the relief for all the people yeah. listening. Um, I know we spend far too much time processing all that stuff. Yeah. And we've got, again, we've got a subject matter expert working on that. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're keeping a close eye and they're keeping uh, really close to um, the legislation around that and what's coming right. out. Yeah. So then, you know, we've been talking about listening to advisors and and the ensemble space. I'm curious if you have any examples where some advisors gave you some feedback. Maybe it was surprising or or great insight that actually did cause a feature to get released that otherwise might not have been. I've seen it just in the 18 months. I've seen it quite a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, so any of the recent changes to document notes yep. have all it's all stemmed from client feedback. I mean, direct client feedback. So, Perfect. you know, the file size, the file sizes, the renaming of attachments, the preview of attachments, like it's stuff that people are asking for. But I start to think about it, Peter, essentially every feature with an X-Plan has been asked for by somebody. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and we've just gone through a big exercise. On, it's a feedback process exercise yeah. in, our, in our business where we've set up, I guess, what happens when a client provides feedback. Yeah. How do we bring it into our product team? How do they classify it? How do they um, track it to make sure that we are listening to yep. it um, and building that into what the roadmap is in the future as well? Um, yeah. And it is, look, it is hard, isn't it? Because um, a squeaky wheel will get attention. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes that's not necessarily the magic thing that could make a difference. So it must be hard internally juggling that. Like where do we, where do you apply the energy? What do you do first? Yeah. I and mean, we get a lot of feedback, as yeah. you could probably be aware. Um, we want to make sure we're validating their feedback as much as possible. So what you'll probably find is our product team will be a bit more um, engaged with customers. Okay. Right. Because they want to be able to field and test and validate feedback to make sure that what we are delivering is stuff that's been asked for by our customers. Yeah. And I guess to that end, then, if if somebody listening sees in the ensemble space for Iris that 
say, you know, I might have said, hey, it'd be great if this was in the system. If you either agree or disagree with that, then clearly commenting on that is valuable to you guys because you're getting that validation. It's like, well, what does everybody think? Definitely. Yeah. Hit a like on it, comment, throw in a couple of ideas. I think yeah. the more we hear, and I've already seen it within the ensemble space, yeah. the more we hear around these ideas, we take back into our business. Um, and we are, like, like I said, we are keenly watching everything that happens within that space and to us across all our forums but definitely ensemble because there's a whole heap of really great ideas yeah um, and they're all collaborative ideas yeah and the co- collaboration is interesting isn't it because often great ideas come with layers mm-hmm. right and we can each bring some value so yeah for the listener i think you know really encourage you to even if even if you're quietly stalking that's okay you're allowed to do <laughs> that on the ensemble practice and just watch but if there is something that appeals to you comment Right, and add your thumbs up or or whatever you like to support that because that's where, um, you know, Kerry's team can go, hold on, we've got 500 Mm. comments on that particular request. Maybe we should bump that up the list, guys, when we're planning out the next rollout. Yeah, and we post our product roadmap on Ensemble. Yeah. And we've got a piece in the product roadmap around our next horizons. So that's the stuff that's not scheduled for development as yet in the next two quarters, but it's the stuff that is coming. Is coming, okay. So if you're looking at any of that and go, oh, that's a game changer for me, um, we'd love to hear. Yeah, perfect. Now, look, this Tim and I were laughing when we had our chat uh, (laughs) that in our experience, there'll be something that advisors or staff request that we think should just be really easy to change in the tech. And invariably, it's it's world-ending from the tech providers and vice versa, where you think there's no way that the tech could ever do that. And somebody like you guys will go, oh, yeah, we could just flick that switch. Can you think any examples of that that exist where you just like try to explain to advisors that's actually far more complicated than you think it is? Like I said, I am an advice guy in a tech business. I'm yeah. not a tech guy, so I, I've had these moments myself. Yeah, um, and I don't have a I don't have an exact example, Peter, but I've had examples where, like, I've gone to the tech team and I've gone, oh, that button that's sitting there, can I move it? There you are know, three centimeters to the left on the page, and they just shake their head and said, "Do you know how much work that'll actually?" Be? <laughs> but I've had other times where it's a whole new feature. I'm like, "Oh, what a, what about we do this in Xtools Plus?" And they're like, "We can do that." Right. Um, so what I've found is it's there's no sort of question that is dumb to ask, or I don't know, but a feedback that's that's, and we will be completely upfront and honest on the effort versus what it actually is actually going to give because within a tech company, it's always a trade off conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. So is moving that button three centimeters to the left more important than that feature in Xtools Plus? Probably not. So let's maybe focus on the Xtools Plus one. So yeah, I think for the listeners, is it's we want to hear your feedback. Yeah. Right. Um. We won't be able to address everything. Right, and that's just being completely frank. But we will address the things that are most important to most people that are within our control and things we can do. Yeah, for sure. And I guess you know one of the things that that we found interesting is, and I found with my team, particularly the support team, is there can be some changes that are sort of either layout or where somebody get something, a piece of information might get repeated, so it's easy. So when you're in that spot, you can see it. And I won't have thought to ask, they won't have thought to told me, but when it comes out and we add it, it takes like five minutes off every task the time they do that task. So sometimes it's not even uh, an actual feature change. It's just almost replicating information or or adding that, you know, that little field. Oh, well, can add that to the front. If you'd like that on the home screen, mm-hmm. sure. You know, like it's just thinking a bit differently and asking you guys, like, how hard would that be to do? You, you know, you've got to ask us. Yeah. Like SMAs is an example as well, is that we got told for years around – SMAs, we need to be able to, you know, display them properly and model them properly within portfolios. Um, and it was that was a big task. Yeah. That wasn't a small task. But it got to the point where we were getting asked that many times. We saw a huge efficiency play around portfolio management with yeah. SMAs. And we got, yep, it's worth investing the time and effort into that. And yeah. we did do it. Yeah. So it's not always that it's too hard and we will never do it. It's it's too hard now, but the more and more people want it, the easier yeah. it gets for us to make a decision on it. Right. And I imagine sometimes it's also about being able to visualize what somebody's saying. So if they've gone, look, in this other unrelated to the business tool, this is what I managed to do and this is why it made it easier. If they can at least show you what they're trying to describe, that's got to make a difference too, right? If they can say, this is why that'd be easier. Whereas sometimes I think, you know, as end users, we're not necessarily great at describing those things. Yeah, that's right. And I think the descriptive nature of it is really important. Um, yeah. Annuities is a piece. So we had an advisor explain to us to recommend an annuity that to jump out to external calculators three times for three providers, look at three different PDSs, jump back in the system and try to populate it to an SOA yeah. template. And we looked at it and went, okay, that's something that 
we as an industry need to solve together. Right. And it is. That's, I mean, that's something that we're clearly, you know, the government has changed their view on what they want us to do. Mm. They've said you should all be using income streams, you know, these, mm. these lifetime income streams more. Clearly, we're all going to have to be doing it differently, mm. you know. So I, I, I bet that's something you guys have had to work on for that reason. So as we wrap things up, I'm curious what advice you'd give financial advice principals particularly, you know, to help them get the most of out of their tech stack. You know, how can they make the best use of Iris's tools as they're sort of putting forward their growth goals or their plans for the business? I think it's be really clear on the problem you're trying to solve right. in your business, right? And I think the problem stems oh, the problem is bigger than just technology. Yeah. Right. I think it's understanding why you're in business to start with. So your business vision how your business vision leads into your client experience. Who you're right. serving. Who you're serving. Yeah. Does does your client experience match what you're trying to do as a business? Um, making sure you've got the right people around that as well, right? So yeah. are your teams aligned to your vision? Are they aligned to your client experience? Are they properly upskilled to be able to deliver on that? And then I think what wraps around that is a process. Yeah. Right? And then what yeah. wraps around that is technology. Yeah. So a lot of people, they look at X-Plan and go, okay, well, I just want to solve all my problems using technology. Right. All right. I think there's a few steps that you need to take before you get to that point. Um, and it's that, that full business alignment. And uh, to be honest, I do, used to do a lot of business coaching back at um, IWF. And a lot of that was working with practice principals to uncover that. But it's something that each practice principal can do on their own. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, you're you going to expend energy on something. Let's yep. make sure it's the right thing. Yeah. Uh, and it really is expending of energy, right? It's stepping out of your business to work on that. And there's, yeah. you know, standing on the balcony, get off, getting off the dance floor. There's a lot of analogies that you can put into this. Yeah. Um, but it is about carving out that time to work out, well, what is the business you want to run? How do you client, How do you want to interact with your clients? How do you want your team to get around that? What's the process? What's the technology? Yeah. And piecing that all together is where it becomes, I guess that's where the magic happens. Yeah. And it will help prioritize, right? It'll help you go, well, I know that this thing feels like it's something we should do, but actually in this big plan, let's work on this other thing. It's clearly a core part of what we need to do. And it could be, it's more about the customer experience. It could be all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, w when we've done that, we found a gap in some of the advice we need to give, even though um, we're focusing now on Gen X. One of their biggest issues is their parents and aged care. Uh -huh. I didn't predict that, I've got to say, but it was when we did that digging, we realized we've got a gap. We're going to have to get more educated, you know? So once you've done that deep work, mm. you can make some of those choices a bit better. Yeah, definitely. Is there any, and, and this is probably a huge question, I apologize in advance, but is there any hidden gold you feel like in the X-Plan offering that advisors should be making sure they're on top of? You know, is there anything you feel like, I can't believe more of them aren't using this particular thing? Visualize is definitely one. Okay. Right. That is probably one that anytime I show any advisor, they're actually instantly impressed by it, but not many people know it's there. Okay. Um, so that's one that I'd say, if you haven't seen it and you are using Xbox Plus in any shape or form, please, please check it out. And to be honest, if you're not using Xbox Plus, but you love a goals-based conversation with cash flow modeling, then check it out as well. Yeah. But that goes for all the tools within X-Plan. So- you know, if you're not using portfolio to manage your portfolios, I don't know, you know, I don't know how you're managing it effectively. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're not using the research tools to compare products, I don't know how you're doing it either. Yeah. Like if, if you're still having to pick up a PDS or anything outside of the system, um, I would say try find that gold with an X-Plan. And I think yeah. squeezing the most out of X-Plan as a system before you look elsewhere is also probably something that I really recommend, right? Um, Definitely. It's making the most of what's sitting in front of you and really exploring it. Exactly. And in all the... I don't know, 70 plus interviews I did on the Advice Tech podcast, that was the one thing that stood out for me. No matter what tool you spoke about, none of us were using anywhere near enough mm -hmm. of the tool. You know, we were skating skating the top of it. Um, and so, you know, before doing anything dramatic, you know, make sure you've got, you've sort of really dived deep into what's there uh, because there'll be huge value just applying the thing you've already got, mm. you know. And we've also got some really great users of X-Plan. Right. And really great setups of X-Plan. So it's using the communities around you as well. And I think Ensemble is a really clear space, right? Yeah. Is that there are people on Ensemble that are using the system to the best of its ability. It's how can we actually share that more? Yeah. And we want to do that from Iris. Right. Yeah. Like we definitely want to do that from Iris. But we also want to facilitate that brilliance from others as well. Yeah, perfect. So, all righty. Well, for those of you listening who really are, woohoo, this is exciting. I'm feeling really positive about my tech stack. Then I'd absolutely recommend checking out the RS space on the Ensemble platform. If you are not on the Ensemble platform, first up, sign up. It's free. You can get straight on there. And then you will see on the left, you can join the RS space. 
it's a really great place to start those uh, conversations. To be frank, you could just sit, like Harry was saying, you could just sit and watch the conversations going on, the questions that get asked and the content that the IRIS team are putting on there. It'll get you in tip-top shape and make a huge difference. Um, and if you've got those questions or ideas for the IRIS team, it's a perfect place to share them. Ask your your peers on Ensemble, what do you guys think? Do you think this is a good idea or not? And clearly, Kerry and the team are going to suck all that information up and, and consider it on their rollout going forward. Kerry, thank you so much for your time. This has been fantastic. Thank you for having me. 